Well, some of you have been watching me for a while and you're probably wondering who is this guy and what gives him the right to talk about diabetes? In this video, I'll answer those questions. In this video, I want to share a little of my own story and my struggle with blood sugar issues and answer some of the questions that I'm frequently asked. We're getting quite a few viewers and subscribers on this channel these days, and if you're going to watch me and perhaps learn a few things from me, the least I can do is share where I'm coming from and how I even got involved in this business of talking about diabetes and what we can do to overcome it. Let me begin by acknowledging what I am not, and that is, I am not a doctor. I was amused a while back when some hothead wrote in the comments, Don't listen to this guy. Go to a real doctor. Well, he was implying that I was a fake doctor. But I'm not a fake doctor, and I'm not a real doctor. I'm no doctor at all. I don't make any pretense of being a doctor. I'm just a very ordinary guy who was attacked with diabetes about 17 years ago, and found a way to overcome it. I've kept diabetes at bay all this time and have far better blood sugar control now than I did in my 40s, thank the Lord. My mother had diabetes and I saw firsthand what it did to her. When she was my age, her circulation was terrible and her veins and her legs began to collapse. She had numerous operations, stents put in her legs, replacement of veins, and so forth. And all this was happening while she was in her 60s, as the doctors tried valiantly to help her keep her legs. But it was in vain, and in the last decade of her life, in her 70s, she ended up having both her legs amputated. Even though she managed to live to the age of 80, those last 10 years were not quality years. But even though I was fully aware of her ordeal, I never supposed that diabetes would happen to me. I guess we all think like that. Major diseases are for those other guys, not for us. But as I look back now, I realize I was showing signs of blood sugar issues as early as my late 20s. One of the signs of this was a shaky, jittery feeling I started noticing in those days. And these feelings were especially noticeable on Saturdays. Sometimes I'd feel so shaky I could barely sign my name legibly. Why Saturdays? Well, I know now, but I didn't then. Every Saturday morning would have pancakes. I was a big eater in those days, and I'd eat a large stack of pancakes drenched with sugary syrup. And a few hours later, I'd have those jittery, shaky feelings. They'd pass after a while, and I just assumed it was one of those things. But in truth, it was evidence, even around the age of 30, that I was showing metabolic syndrome. But of course, nobody was even talking about that in those days. When I reached the age of 40, things got worse. At times, I'd feel lightheaded after a high-carb meal, even to the point where it seemed like I might pass out. I remember once, after eating pizza and downing it with a regular Coke, we went to Walmart. While walking through the store, I suddenly had the feeling I was about to faint. I hurried out of that store and went and sat in the car trying to compose myself while my wife finished the shopping. Finally, it actually happened. I did faint. I was at church on Sunday morning after eating a big bowl of raisin nut bran for breakfast. As I got up toward the end of the service, I felt extremely lightheaded and headed for the bathroom. But I didn't quite make it. Close to the men's bathroom, I put my back up against a wall and allowed myself to slide down to the floor. The next thing I knew, a nurse was with me and the paramedics had been called. When they tested my blood sugar, the monitor showed the letters L-O, low. My blood sugar was so dangerously low, it didn't even register a number, which meant it was probably below 40. So what in the world was happening to me? I was having what I call natural hypos. I apparently had an overreacting pancreas combined with serious insulin resistance, and these two factors were at war with each other. The more my cells resisted the insulin, the more insulin my pancreas was spewing out, and eventually all that excess insulin would succeed in driving my blood sugar down, down, down. In fact, it would drive it so much down, and there was so much leftover insulin that it would go far too low. 
I immediately started doing some reading and research to see if I could find something that would help. I knew this had something to do with blood sugar and the possible onset of diabetes by now, and I read someone who recommended a vegetarian diet. He seemed to back up his theories with a few studies, and he talked about how healthy the Seventh-day Adventists were, and it sounded reasonable to me. So I immediately went vegetarian, and my fluctuating blood sugar got ten times worse. <laughs> Things got so bad. I was eating some kind of snack every couple of hours just to make sure I didn't pass out. It was a terrible, crazy, scary, ugly time in my life. I wondered, am I doomed to live like this the rest of my days? The beginning of the end of my problems occurred when the secretary at the ministry where I worked gave me a blood sugar monitor and spent a few minutes in the afternoon teaching me how to use it. Once I had that monitor, I went crazy testing myself. I didn't just test my morning fasting blood sugar the way most people do. I somehow realized I needed to test after my meals, and I found that typically I'd see a peak in my blood sugar about an hour after eating. I also saw that many times after high-carb meals, my blood sugar would drop like crazy about three hours later. So I was bouncing up and down and up and down with all kinds of wild fluctuations. You talk about unstable blood sugar, I surely had it. You may ask, didn't you go to the doctor during all this? Yeah, I did, but the strange thing was that in spite of the fluctuating blood sugar, by the time I'd slept all night, my fasting blood sugar the next morning would be in the normal range. And the one A1C test I had also showed a normal blood sugar number. I now know what was going on was that my body was in the process of breaking down metabolically. I was surely headed for diabetes, but I wasn't there yet, at least in terms of the numbers of my fasting blood sugar and my A1C score. And this is what fooled me and fooled the doctors. Looking at my numbers, they couldn't tell me, you're diabetic. They didn't really know what to say, except that one doctor told me to eat more protein when I told her I was eating a vegetarian diet. And so I started eating meat again, and that did help a bit, but it didn't solve things. What I didn't know then, but I know now, is that fasting blood sugar is usually the last thing that will break down with metabolic syndrome. I was no doubt having insulin levels through the roof and doing serious damage to my body, even though my pancreas was gamely trying to keep my blood sugar levels low. I was headed for disaster and full-fledged, full-scale, flaming type 2 diabetes. But once I started using a blood sugar meter, I was off to the races. I tested myself like crazy, in the morning, before meals, after meals, at night. And once I started this, it didn't take long at all for me to figure out what I needed to do. I had my aha moment when I was on a ministry trip and was eating meals at restaurants. I was just starting to do these post-meal tests, and my first meal I tested was a large hamburger with a bunch of Fritos corn chips. An hour after my meal, my blood sugar read around 185, and I was depressed. I knew that was too high. I immediately went for a walk to try to bring my glucose levels down. The next day, for lunch, I was determined to get a more reasonable number. I figured a chef's salad would probably be a lot better than that large hamburger with its huge bun and all those chips. So I ate my chef's salad, waited an hour, and tested myself. If I remember right, my blood sugar peak was somewhere around 118 to maybe 125, somewhere in that range, and that was when the light came on. I got so excited. It became evident to me, as a result of those two meals and those two tests, that I could control my blood sugar levels. I could determine whether my numbers went high or stayed low simply by which foods I put in my mouth. And that was the beginning of the end of my blood sugar issues. I quickly saw that the number one factor that drove blood sugar high was carbohydrates. The more carbs I ate, the higher my blood sugar rose. The less carbs I ate, the more my blood sugar stayed in bounds. And I slashed the carbs in my diet and my blood sugar quickly stabilized. No more highs, no more lows, no more feeling like I was about to pass out. Just beautiful, stable blood sugar. I was very tunnel-focused. I wasn't trying to become an expert in nutrition. I'm still not. When I bought a pound of hamburger, I didn't ask the butcher if this was grass-fed or corn-fed beef. All I wanted to know was, would it raise my blood sugar? 
It took me a long time to give up on margarine because margarine didn't seem to raise blood sugar and it was a lot easier to spread on things. I have given it up now, by the way, but it did take me a while because in those days, all I cared about were the numbers that showed up on my little blood sugar meter. In some ways, I see myself as a miniature version of Dr. Richard Bernstein. Not that I know even a tenth of what he knows about diabetes, that's for sure, but we both came to some solid conclusions about lowering blood sugar by fanatically testing ourselves over and over again. And the more we tested, the more convinced we became that carbohydrates are the driving force behind high blood glucose levels. And not only did my blood sugar levels come down, as a side benefit, two issues that I was struggling with in those days mysteriously vanished. One was what I believe was rheumatoid arthritis. Take a look at these fingers. If you look carefully, you can see that they're not normal. These knots in my joints are clear evidence of arthritis. You may say, yeah, but you're an old guy, so what? You've got arthritis. But that's not the whole story. My fingers became deformed like this when I was in my early 40s, when my fasting blood sugar was normal. In those days, my arthritis was so bad, it was sometimes painful to shake hands. I remember one man on the board of our ministry had a particularly firm handshake, and it was like torture to shake hands with him. I was too proud to tell him my problems, so I just endured the torture. I was shaking hands and smiling outwardly and grimacing in great pain inwardly. I thought to myself, if I'm this bad in my 40s, what in the world will I be like in my 60s? But it was not high blood sugar that caused this. It was no doubt high insulin levels. And once I brought my blood sugar down through low-carb eating and those insulin levels went down, my arthritis just packed its bags and went away. Now, I still have the bumps in my fingers, but the pain is gone and there's no sign of any further joint damage. And now I'm in my 60s and I'm better than I was in my 40s. Another issue that somehow resolved when I went low-carb was irritable bowel syndrome. I had this frequently, and it was no fun, and it came on me in the most inopportune times. But once I slashed the carbs, lowering both blood sugar and insulin levels, I noticed one day, hey, I'm not having this problem anymore. Today it's been many, many years since then, and I thank God for deliverance. Now, I've always been a writer. I can remember trying, but not succeeding, in writing a Western novel during my summer vacation when I was 16 years old. And I've written hundreds of articles on various Bible topics as an adult. So when I found victory over runaway blood sugar, I had to write about it. I ended up writing a full-size book, and then I sent out query letters to various publishers, seeing if I could get it published and I had the unpleasant experience of receiving one rejection after another. Every single query letter was met with rejection, saying thanks but no thanks. Finally, I put a synopsis of the book in a journal that sent out a newsletter to various publishers, and an editor for Harvest House Publishers read the synopsis and became interested. She had a personal reason for her interest. She was struggling with blood sugar issues herself. She contacted me and asked me to send her the book. And when she read it, she was so impressed, she started putting some of my ideas into practice in her own life and diet, and she found almost immediate relief from some of her most troubling symptoms. In fact, she found so much relief, she became my biggest fan and began pushing my book to the higher-ups in the company. She was so persistent and insistent in demanding they publish my book, they decided to do it. Publishers absolutely hate to publish books by people who've never been published and who aren't famous, and that surely described me. But due to this lady's persistence, the book was published. And to their amazement, the book took off and they made numerous printings. The book, titled Overcoming Runaway Blood Sugar, sold around 125,000 copies and became one of their better sellers that year. After a few years, I wrote a second book, which I titled 60 Ways to Lower Your Blood Sugar. This time, Harvest House needed no persuasion. They were eager to publish the book, and it has now sold a quarter of a million copies and is still selling at this time. You wouldn't believe how many emails I've received from grateful men and women who've been able to bring their blood sugar levels down into the normal range by the simple practice of carbohydrate restriction. I honestly don't believe that in my books or in these YouTube videos, 
I'm saying things that others don't know better than I do, but somehow God seems to have given me a gift as a teacher to make complicated things simple so that people can understand it. One of the comments I've received in emails and in the comments on this YouTube channel is that what I say is just common sense and easy to understand. One person wrote that they had read something like six books on diabetes, but mine was the first one they understood. Well, that's me. I'm a common, simple guy, and I talk in common, simple language. So I try to use my little gift as a communicator to share a positive message with people in my books and in these videos that you can see victory in this area. Diabetes is not quite the unbeatable monster you thought it was. To put it in World War II terms, it has a soft underbelly. And if we cut out the sugars, the refined and processed carbs, cut down on fruit, and focus more on meats, fat, and vegetables, we can slay that monster. Some ask me, are you a diabetic? Well, technically no, since my fasting blood sugar and my A1C scores do not fall in the diabetic range. I took a home A1C test a couple of days ago, in fact, and it was at 5.2. No doctor would consider that diabetic or even pre-diabetic. Sometimes when people ask me if I'm diabetic, I answer no, but I passed up a marvelous opportunity to be a diabetic. If I ate the way most Americans eat and the way I ate for 40 plus years, I would surely be a full-scale diabetic by now. And yet I take no medicine, no insulin, and by my diet I'm able to keep in a good range. And no, I'm not a real doctor, not even a fake doctor. The truth is, this whole diabetes emphasis and this YouTube channel is not my first love or my first priority. I'm a Christian minister, and I consider teaching the Bible and introducing people to Jesus Christ far more important than talking about health issues. After all, even if you get your blood sugar completely under control and extend your life for an extra 20 quality years, well, that's a great blessing for sure but you're still going to die. But if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will live forever. Now, I do have another channel. It's our ministry channel, and there I share short devotional thoughts from the scriptures along with reports on our African missions. I always put a link at the end of these diabetes videos that will take you to one of my devotional talks, so I hope you'll click on them sometime. I'm happy to be able to help people with their blood sugar problems, whether they're Christian or atheist, Hindu or Muslim. But my great hope is that they'll see that this help is really coming from the heart of the God who loves them and who eagerly wants them in his family, that they may live with him forever.